A very warm good evening to you. Just as a little aside, we received news just as we were heading off uh, for the Monte Carlo from uh, Enniskillen to the meeting tonight <coughs> that um, there was a young man who put his trust in the Lord from the Banbridge Academy. He had been there and had been quite argumentative early on, but uh, was rather surprised that there were good, solid answers to the questions people ask rhetorically, as if God doesn't have any answers for their tough questions. Took a couple of CDs, which were provided by some of the uh, young people, and uh, listened to them, and woke up in the morning and thought to himself, for the first time in my life, I can't think of one good reason not to receive the Lord Jesus. And he professed salvation. So thank you for your prayers, and we pray for continued blessing. I think this is one of the things that marks the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. They expected a harvest, not just one blade, but they expected that some seed would produce 30, 60, and 100 fold, 10,000% return on the investment. And so uh, the Apostle Paul would speak of a man who was the first fruits of Achaia. Not the, f not the only one saved, the first one, the beginning of a harvest. Think of this young man. Think of all of his unsaved friends and relatives as they see the change in his life and what an impact that could have. And so this is what we need. We can't do this one at a time. We need the domino effect. We need to see others reaching others. As the poet said, if every one, 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 and every one, 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 that, that's what we need. We need to see the ongoing effect of the gospel. Now, I'd like to make a few introductory comments this evening. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to all who have sacrificed and rearranged their schedules and have made the journey here, uh, many of you night by night, faithfully to hear the Word of God. I know some of it has not entirely been easy to listen to. It certainly hasn't always been easy to preach. But um, it was uh, Amy Carmichael who said, if you have never been hurt by a word from God, it is probable that you have never heard God speak. Sometimes he gives us a pat on the back, sometimes he gives it a little bit lower, and we need both, don't we, to be encouraged and exhorted. And then secondly, I would like to give my deep and heartfelt thanks to the conveners of the uh, meetings, for those who arranged them, and for the elders. It was a very courageous thing they did, and uh, I realized that... Um, when elders invite a brother to come and open up the Word of God, it's a solemn responsibility, and we thank the Lord for them and their willingness to do this. And then thirdly, I'd like to thank in advance for their graciousness those who perhaps did not attend and who may not agree with everything that has been said during this session. You know, it's... Um, I take it very seriously, this matter of speaking as the oracles of God. I'm not here to win popularity contests, as you probably have noticed. I'm not here to promote my particular agenda. I'm here as carefully and clearly as possible to explain the principles as I see them in the Word of God. And I would like to deal with those who disagree in good faith, and I would hope to be given the same consideration. I am more than open to um, talking with those who disagree and hearing scripture and hearing uh, explanations and, and uh, interpretations of passages of scripture. And I am the first one to tell you that there are things that we do that are traditions which are not always a bad thing. It's not, it's not a bad thing. I mean, after you've done something two or three times, it becomes a tradition. The time of a meeting is a traditional thing, and uh, it's not necessarily wrong. A group of old men didn't get together and say, let's make up some traditions. And one of them said, I've got a bad idea. Oh, well, yeah, let's do that. You know, originally they were good ideas, 
and uh, they worked well. But there are two problems with a vine. One is the shoot, the, the sucker. And the sucker is unprincipled growth. It sometimes looked like the healthiest part of the vine, but it never produces fruit. The other problem is deadwood. Now, deadwood has the form that once bore fruit, but it doesn't bear fruit anymore. It's become uh, petrified, essentially, and it no longer bears the life principle. And we need to be willing. We're not talking about people here. We're talking about attitudes and ways of thinking. We need to be prepared to cut back the sucker attitude, that is the unprincipled growth that does not follow the truth of the word of God. And on the other hand, those things that once bore fruit but are no longer bearing fruit and in fact get in the way of growth and development in the life of the believer and our corporate life together. So um, uh, traditions do have a secondary benefit in that initially they were a good idea, but they also provide a certain stability to the life of the assembly. If every time I came home from preaching, my wife had rearranged all the furniture and painted all the walls, I wouldn't feel at home after a while. Nothing would be familiar. It's okay to do things in a familiar way and to say, we do these things. No, there's no Bible verse. We don't have to find some obscure application to some obscure verse somewhere in the middle of Leviticus to prove to you why we do this. You know, we do this because well, we like to do it. It works. It's nice. And we do it. You don't have to prove everything um, by some verse in the Bible. But the things that we do in which we lay claim to the Word of God and say this is based on Scripture, it's very important that we're consistent with Scripture. We understand the principles and do it according to the scriptural pattern. The danger is, if we start taking a verse out of here and a verse out of there, um, saying we're New Testament believers, but we keep quoting Old Testament verses to prove it, the danger is that those who hear it, after a while, they get wise to us. And they start to say, wait a minute, that's not a fair interpretation of that passage. That's got nothing to do with that. And the danger is that then they begin to throw everything overboard and they say, you know, I, I think these are all things that you've just made up. And so it's important that if we are telling people this is, we do this, this is, we're happy with this, we're not saying it's a great principle in scripture, but it's a happy way to do it, it works well, we're happy with this, well that's good. But when we do say that it's the word of God, we better be based not on some obscure application of it, but be able to see the principles laid out for us in the Word of God. Let's turn to the notes for a few minutes. I don't want to spend a great deal of time on them. Um, they're, they're fairly straightforward tonight, and I don't want to get distracted into a great debate on eschatology. That's not the purpose of this series. But I want to point out to you in the notes, we're at page 40, the church's future. Someone has said, the church has many critics, but no rivals. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. God does not have an alternate plan. He has laid out for us this magnificent plan and the Lord Jesus did not say, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, except for the last few years. He did not say, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, until eventually, as we're drawing to the end of the age, it's going to crumble. No. The Lord is building. He's going to finish the job. The last stone placed will just proceed, are being swept into glory, and the presentation of the capstone, the headstone of the corner. So God's plan is right on schedule. He knows what he's doing. He is not lagging behind. He's only uh, holding back his plan, says Peter, because he's not willing that any should perish. But he continues to build into the church living stones, and he is keeping up to his schedule. And we need to be encouraged by that and realize that this period of time in the history of the world is the time when God is working out his counsels, gathering out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation, a people 
to himself. What exciting days we live in as we see the world scene realigning for that moment when the Lord Jesus will speak his word and say, come up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, I've given a little introduction in the first section <coughs> uh, regarding the overcomers as they are portrayed for us in the words of the Lord Jesus in the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Who are these overcomers? John, who also wrote the book of the Revelation, wrote in 1 John 5, 4, Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. I believe that if we take these seven vignettes of the overcomer and put them together, we have a beautiful illustration of every true believer. We overcome through faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So I leave that with you, and you'll notice that during this readying period, we are to be waiting and watching and working. And then the next thing on God's schedule is the resurrection of the believing dead. Who is going to be raised? Well, the dead in Christ. That term, the dead in Christ, is not uniquely a Christian term. It means the dead in the Messiah, those who have died in hopes of the Messiah. And as we mentioned the other evening, I believe that gathered together at that time will be all those whose hope and trust is in the Messiah. There will be a gathering together of one in Christ and Immediately on that will be the reconstitution of the bodies of those who are living so that we will be caught up together and there will be a double reunion with them and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? One old brother said we won't be more stupid up there than we are down here. If we recognize them down here, of course we'll recognize them there. In fact, the scripture points out that we'll recognize all of God's people. There will be no need for name tags in heaven. You'll recognize Moses and Abraham because, well, they'll look exactly like them. At the present time, we don't look like, like us, you know. You see a little wizened up old soul, maybe full of arthritis, bent over. That's not what she really looks like. We will receive the things done in the body. In other words, there will be a kind of turning inside out and the hidden man of the heart will then be manifested. And every one of us will be given back our fully developed personalities as wrought by the Spirit of God through grace. And in that day, every one of us will be like Christ, what we will be uniquely like Christ, in a way that no one else will be like him. And we'll all be given a new name, a name that matches our personality. The Lord Jesus, uh, throughout the Old Testament, he would pause, he would, he would visit through these pre-incarnate revelations of himself. He would visit Abram and Moses and Sarah and so on. And he would change their names, wouldn't he? And he changed Peter's name. He changed others. He would, he would give them a new name because the old name didn't really match what he thought of them. And so he would give them a new term of endearment. The scripture says, he calleth his own by name. That doesn't simply mean that he knows what your name is and use it. He has a new name for you, a new term of endearment. And every one of us will be given a new name when we get home to heaven that will exactly match us. And every one of us will be like the Lord, but uniquely like him in a way that no one else is like him. You can see this through the Old Testament. You see, uh, when, you, when I say Abraham, you think faith. When I say Moses, meekness. When I say David, you say a man after God's heart. When I say Job, you say patience or endurance. That doesn't mean that these other men didn't have these other graces, but it seemed there was a particular grace that the Lord was working into their heart through those circumstances. And so every one of us has a custom design set of circumstances. Some people have physical pain, some people have financial reverses, some people have family problems. Different sets of pressures that are brought to bear on our lives, not to crush us, but to mold us and change us 
according to his divine plan. When the potter sits down to the wheels, he sees, when he looks at that lump of clay called you, he sees a perfect vessel. The perfect vessel is not on the wheels. The perfect vessel is in the mind of the potter. And as he presses on the clay, wonder of wonders, that misshapen lump of clay, little by little, becomes more and more like the vessel in the mind of the potter until one day the two vessels will match. And you will be just what he had in mind. Isn't that marvelous? So that when you get to heaven, you will have a special portfolio. The, the grace that God has worked into you, his mercy and kindness, you will have the privilege of revealing to the world a particular aspect of the loveliness of Christ that no one else will share with him just the way you do. And you'll be able to tell how through the circumstances of life, oftentimes circumstances that you thought were quite a mistake, and you wouldn't have planned it that way, <laughs> You would plan your life just the way he's planning it if you knew as much as he did. And he's working it out. And in that day, we will be the trophies. We will be the, the 3D audiovisual presentations of the grace and mercy of God, according to Ephesians chapter 2. He will manifest his manifold grace, his manifold wisdom, and his manifold mercies in the lives of his people and we'll have the privilege of showing people how God reached down, took something out of the miry clay, lifted it up, took us out of the dunghill, and has set us with princes. Ladies and gentlemen, the Christian has his ups and downs, but we're guaranteed the last one's going to be up. And the hope of the child of God is all bright, it's all happy, and we look forward to that with unmingled joy when we shall see him as he is and be like him at last. So there's the resurrection and the rapture and then the day of rewards, number four. You see I'm hurrying through the notes. Not simply rewards, but recompense. Whatever your, the, the servants of the Lord have covered at their own expense, he said, in the story of the Good Samaritan, I will repay, for he is no man's debtor. There are things that we have gone to expense. There are, I'm not sure how the Lord's going to do this. My children have done without a father. My wife has done without a husband. It won't be good enough for them to somehow get some kind of financial remuneration. I'm not sure how the Lord's going to do this, but somehow he is going to recompense us in such a way that when we get to heaven, we'll never think, all I gave up for the Lord and I just get heaven and eternal life and God? Is that, is that it? Of course not. We will be so filled with the blessings of heaven, with the riches that he will pour out upon us, that all the sufferings of this present time will not be worthy to be compared. They won't even show up on the scale. They won't come to mind. And we will at last realize what a generous-hearted God we have, and that we haven't lost a thing in the bargain. We gave up earth, and he gave us heaven in exchange. We gave up time, he gave us eternity. We gave up ourselves, and he gave us himself. <laughs> How what a thing that will be. So, the rewards, the recompense, and responsibilities will be given out. Here's the proportion. If you're faithful with a coin, he'll give you a city. That's some proportion, isn't it? Faithful with a coin, he'll give you a city. I don't know what's waiting for us, but I do know this. God is not boring. The scripture says, of the extension of his kingdom, there will be no end. We're going to run the universe with him. And he's got big plans, you can be sure of this. We will not be sitting around wondering what to do on a Sunday afternoon. There will be endless opportunities. His servants shall serve him. And it will be said of us, as it was said of Solomon's servants, happy are thy men, happy are thy servants. Now, I will just point out, the, in the issue of rewards, there are some people who feel um, perhaps that they're more spiritual than Paul or the Lord Jesus because they don't think you should live for rewards. Now, Jesus taught rewards and Paul lived for them, didn't he? 
It must be that we have some misunderstanding about the subject of rewards. We have this idea that rewards are mercenary, and we don't want that feeling. We just want to do it for the Lord's sake. Ah, he says, that's just the point. The idea of rewards, as we see the four and twenty elders representing all the believing, casting their crowns at the feet of the Lord, evidently the glory of the rewards will not be for the recipients, but will be for the giver. And so the Lord says, you look after my business, I'll look after yours. Anything that is accomplished through us will go to the glory of the Lord, not to us at all. I told the story how on one occasion I went to an art gallery to see a series of paintings which had been done by a man who was in a prison camp. He had found some scraps of paper somewhere. He had made a brush out of the tail hairs of an unfortunate dog. He had um, got blue out of his prison uniform. He used his own blood. He had squished bugs. He had got a burnt umber and burnt sienna from the dirt, and he painted some of the most beautiful watercolors I've ever seen. Now, when I looked at those paintings, did I think to myself, I know his secret. I'm going to have to go get some mud. It was, it was the quality of the material he used. That's the secret. Did any glory go to the dog tail hair brush or to the mud that he used? No. All, the, the amazing thing is that he could do anything at all with that garbage. And when we see the masterpiece that the Lord has been able to accomplish, and we look at ourselves and say, Lord, how did you do that? With, with my stumbling, fumbling testimony? With my weak, half-hearted attempt? With my cold-hearted worship? How did you do that? This will be the biggest shock in heaven, won't it, when we stand on shore and dare to take a look at ourselves and say, Lord, you did it. I seem so uncooperative, so slow to learn, so cantankerous, so set in my ways, but somehow you have accomplished it, and I'm like your son. You said you'd do that, didn't you? And you've done it. Oh, it will be such an amazing thing. And there won't be any any desire at all for self-glory, you will say, oh Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give the glory. The purpose of the rewards is that we might have something with which to honor him, something with which to glorify him. Like the story I've told of the horse race in which the, the one rule was that the last horse across the finish line would win. Well, you know what happened, they slowed down, slowed down, finally stopped. Well, they got off the horses and had a little conversation, and they got back on the horses, and they took off like the wind for the finish line. What did they do? Change horses. So if I got across first, my horse won, didn't it? And so that's what the Lord has done. He's put his work into our hands. He's taken our work and put it into his hands so that anything that is accomplished, we know it was the Lord who did it. He gave us the time, the opportunity, the ability, the encouragement, and someday he'll give us the reward. And we'll say, Lord, excuse me, this is yours. You did it. And we'll have the joy of giving him something. We won't have anything else to give, you know. Why, everything we have is his. Our life is his. Our joy is his. Our peace is his. The only thing we'll have is the little bit that's been accomplished down here by his grace alone, he'll put it into our hands. It's a bit like my children who come the 1st of January. If anyone wants to mark it down, if you're taking notes, my birthday is January 3rd. And um, I'll give you the address later, but they come to me and they say, Daddy, um, your birthday's coming up. I know what they want. They want me to give them some of my congealed sweat, my hard-earned cash, you see? And they want to take that and take it down to some department store and buy some little junky plastic things because I don't give them enough money to buy anything decent. And they bring it home and they wrap it up with more tape than paper and they, and they put a little tag on it and they give it to me. Is that a good deal? I think it's a wonderful deal. They take my money and they turn it into little bits of love. And they give it back to me. I think it's wonderful. You know, that's what God's doing. He has to give us everything we use, 
He has to give us our strength, our energy, our ability, our opportunity. He has to bless the word. He has to give souls the consciousness of sin. He has to give them illumination. I mean, what exactly is it that we do in the process? Well, we just show up, basically. We're just willing. He said to Moses, I'll be your mouth and your message. Just show up. Just be there. And that's basically what he's asking us to do. Those mighty men of David, what does it say? They just stuck it. When everybody else ran home, they just showed up. They just stayed there. And the Lord wrought a great victory. It's the Lord who does it. And so when we get home to heaven and he unrolls this magnificent masterpiece, we will stand agape at it. It will make this creation look like nothing. So much so that the, that the prophet said, these former things won't even come to mind. The, the magnificence of a sunrise or the starry heavens, why, they're just going to all disappear. And what we're going to see is the new creation composed of people. And that's the whole point of Hebrews 11, isn't it? That in Hebrews 11, we often quote verse 3, which says that um, uh, by faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. What's he talking about? Well, read the rest of the chapter. God's world is being constructed of people. All this other stuff, Alpha Centauri and butterflies and everything else, that's all just the stage. And his real work is building a magnificent edifice for himself, a place where he'll feel at home in the midst of his people, the tabernacle of God with men again. And he will gather us around himself and we'll be at home and we'll never say goodbye. We'll never leave again home at last, every one of his children home there. And oh, the joy of it. And so when we think of rewards, we ought to be spurred on by this, that, that what he's giving us, he's giving us so that we'll be able to give it back for the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus. There'll be the rejoicing, the marriage day of the Lamb. I don't want to cross the line to impropriety, but the consummation of a marriage is a very special thing, isn't it? We are presently engaged to the Lord Jesus. We are not married to him. The word that is used for the earnest of the spirit in Ephesians chapter 1 is the word used in modern Greek for the wedding ring, the engagement ring. And that ring is a, so to speak, an earnest, a, a promise, a declaration. There's a big day coming. A day when we who have trod the lonely desert at last meet our bridegroom. And again, I don't want to be carnal in, in thinking, but we have to realize that what a bride-to-be enjoys before the wedding pales into insignificance on that day when man and woman are united in a special way, the consummation of the marriage. And the Lord uses this picture to remind us that there is yet a day coming when the best that we have enjoyed of Christ now will be far surpassed it is called far better, far better. That means that I will not be at the back of a crowd. I don't understand the geography of heaven, but I have the Lord Jesus personally with me every moment of the day. And for me to end up at the back of a crowd seeing the Lord Jesus talking to somebody else down at the front will not be far better. I don't know how the Lord's going to arrange it, but I know that I'm gonna have him personally for myself, and you will too, we shall see him not at the back of a crowd holding up our opera glasses. We will see him face to face, face to face. Then we have the return. The Lord is going to come back and he's going to establish his kingdom, not any old where, but in the very city from which he was taken out to be crucified. And those who saw him, who pierced him, will, will bemoan the fact. They will fall before him. The, the kings of the earth will gasp. They'll shut their mouths at him. 
when Jesus returns, and he'll return with us, and he will be admired in his saints. He will, he will manifest to the world that these folks gathered in this auditorium were his own brothers. He will not be ashamed of us in that day. I trust we're not ashamed of him now. He's nothing to be ashamed of. He will not be ashamed of us in that day. Your life is hid with Christ in God. This is not the day for our applause. This is not the day for our plaudits and our being accepted by the world. Your life is hid with Christ in God, but when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. When the prime minister or the president is going to appear in glory and all the TV cameras are there, he doesn't say, oh, hold on, just wait a minute here. <laughs> uh, this, uh, come in, come into the picture here, that's good. This is the man who prepares my breakfast every morning. Here's the lady that cleans my bedroom. Good, oh, yes, come in, Alice. That's, that's, let's gather around her. This man shines my shoes here. Come, that's it, that's good, good. Let's, can, can everybody get in the picture here? Oh, they don't appear with him in glory, do they? But the lowliest servant the humblest of God's people. In that day, he'll make sure we're all in the picture. We shall appear with him in glory. It's called the manifestation of the sons of God, the unveiling of the sons of God, when those of us who look like butchers and bakers and candlestick makers will suddenly appear as those whom we really are, the seed royal, the ruling class of heaven. It'll be quite a day, won't it? when God will be vindicated that he picked the right man for the job, that the Lord Jesus has done what he said he would do, he has finished the work which God gave him to do. And then the reigning. He shall reign forever and ever, and we shall reign with him. Please note the end of the church's enemies, those that have caused such grief to the people of God, the flesh, the world, and the devil. At last, done for. And what a day it's going to be when never again a blush will rise to my cheek. Never again will I hang my head in shame. Never again will I have to say to the Lord, I'm sorry. It'll all be past. And we shall please him as he has pleased us. We'll serve him as we ought. We'll worship as we ought. We'll be what we ought, for we shall be like him. Well, in the remaining minutes now, I would like to think with you about the way ahead. This is not an easy thing to think about, because as we've been thinking about the church in these two weeks together, we have seen a very vigorous, expanding, encouraging scene. We have looked into the Word of God. We have seen believers who really loved each other. So much so that if they had a piece of real estate and somebody else needed something, they didn't think twice about selling it and giving the money. They really loved the lost. And they went everywhere preaching the gospel. They really loved the Lord. There's no verse in the New Testament that says you have to be at prayer meeting. There's no verse in the New Testament that says you have to read your Bible. The whole idea was they wanted to. And that's what we have to get back to, isn't it? The Old Testament, they had to. The males must appear three times a year in the presence of the Lord for the grand festivals. But in the New Testament, the Lord said, you know, I took Israel kicking and screaming by the hand and I led them through the wilderness like that, like little children who didn't want to leave the toy, the toy department. And, and I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to take you by the heart. You're going to love me. It's not going to be my master. It's going to be my husband. It's going to be a love relationship and you'll, you'll want to do it. That's what we see in the early church that they wanted to be together. They wanted to be in each other's homes. It wasn't like, look folks, we're gonna have to do this more. You've got to do this. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't the 
form. It wasn't the mechanics of the thing. It was an inner working of the Spirit of God, wasn't it? All this talk about uh, women's clothing, you know, it's quite a, it's quite a favorite indoor sport here. <sighs> you know, the thrust of the New Testament is this. That a woman's beauty is not with uh, broidering her hair or putting on pearls. He's not saying don't broider your hair or wear pearls because he goes on to say that it's not in the putting on of apparel, right? Well, obviously he expects the sisters to put on apparel. Well, but he's saying that the real beauty is the inner beauty. And so if we keep stressing the outer things, the meetings, and the outward appearance, we've missed the point, haven't we? If the inner is right, it'll manifest itself in the outer. If we keep the outer right, the danger is that the inner dies through neglect. So what we really want to see is not so much New Testament church form, but first of all, New Testament church life. Form follows function. And so as we have that inner life, that compassion for the lost, that love for Christ, it will begin to change the outer form, won't it? Modesty will be an obvious result of the inner working of the Spirit of God in the sister's heart. The reaching out in the gospel, it will change how we do the gospel because we'll really love the lost more than we'll even love the form of what we do. And we'll want people to get saved. We won't be satisfied with going week after week, month after month, quite content with our own little form while people are dying just outside the door. We won't do that anymore. So that the outward form will take on the characteristics of the New Testament church as a result of the inward reality I want to think a little bit about the times in which we live. And I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Verse 10, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in lifestyle, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the elders. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And we have a grisly list, 19 characteristics of the days in which we live. And then we come down to verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came upon me. And he describes these. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But... Evil men and impostors shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou in the things which thou hast heard and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. What time is it? These are perilous times. These are the last times. But ladies and gentlemen, though the times may be bad, they are the only times we have. This is it. This is your life. God has put you not by accident 
in this particular era of history, and perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We read concerning David, he served his own generation. And we read of men that were with him who had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. It is time to do. It's time to be up and doing. And we need godly men and women who know what the people of God ought to do. What was Paul's advice to a young person in such times as those described? Was it to hunker down till the rapture? Was it try to keep happily, happy with morally inoffensive pastimes? Or to gather regularly in holy clubs to bemoan the world conditions? No, it definitely was not. He tells Timothy to fortify the brethren with nourishing food, the words of faith and good doctrine, to push aside distractions, to exercise himself. The word is gumnazo, to, to strip down anything that is extraneous to the life of faith and to give himself wholly to these things. This world is full of passionate people. People who are passionate about getting a faster computer or smaller phones or exotic vacations or fan fancy cars. They give their lives to breeding dogs, raising exotic orchids, finding the perfect slope, decorating dollhouses and collecting salt shakers. Where are the people who are passionate about the Lord Jesus? It's a question that, that presses on us, isn't it? Because these are days in which there are a million distractions. Gordon Dahl, whoever he is, writes, most middle-class Westerners tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. As a result, their values are distorted and their lifestyle resembles, resembles a cast of characters in search of a plot. In other words, meaningless, purposeless, endless activity to no account. By contrast, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they which have wives be as though they have none, and those that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world is passing away. It doesn't mean you neglect your wife. It means that husband and wife together have come to the realization that they are here on earth for a solemn purpose. It is not to live I don't know, do you call it the Irish dream? We call it the American dream, whatever it is. It's not to live that way. It's not to live for themselves. It's to live for the Lord. I used to think, after I was first married, that maybe I'd settle for second best because the scripture said that when a person is married, they seek how they may please their wife. But if they're single, they seek how they may please the Lord. Until I realized that you could have the best of both worlds if you married a wife who would only be satisfied if you please the Lord. My wife would be horrified if I gave her first place in my life. She will only be satisfied if I live my life wholly for him. And those who weep, listen, we go through hard times. We go through hard times, heartbreaking times among the people of God. And we need to brush away the tears and keep going. It's not easy, I know that. And those who possess as though they don't, Paul will later say in his second letter to the Corinthians, <coughs> as having nothing, not, not having nothing, but as having nothing, and yet possessing all things, as being poor and yet making many rich, wisely using our resources, frugal on ourselves, lavish in the work of God. Now, if Paul says the time is short in his day, what about today, 2,000 years later? John Stott writes, today the church in the West is not persecuted so much as ignored. 
Its revolutionary message has been reduced to a toothless creed for bourgeois suburbanites. Nobody opposes it any longer because really there's nothing to oppose. Or as an English bishop once said, everywhere Paul went, there was a revolution. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. So what time is it? Well, Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 says it's time to wake up. We're in a stupor. We, we need to wake up. We, we've allowed uh, internal dissension, fussing about things that really don't matter, a lick of anything, uh, the color of the carpet or what shape the building is or what the name is, and we've missed the real issues in life, ladies and gentlemen. Paul writes, Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It's time to reincorporate the blessed hope, not just into our theology, but into our lifestyle. So that every day when we get up, we think this could be it. This could be the day. I can't afford to put off witnessing to that neighbor. God has burdened my heart. I can't afford to put off being reconciled to another brother who's offended. This could be my last chance before the judgment seat. I've got to do it today. You can never do a good thing too soon because you never know how soon it'll be too late. This could be it, ladies and gentlemen. And to live in the light of that, to purify ourselves, to get rid of anything that does not have eternal significance, to hold things in our hand and say, what's that going to mean 100 years from now? If it doesn't mean anything then, it really shouldn't mean very much right now. To hold things lightly that will soon be nothing but dust and ashes. It's time to wake out of sleep. It's time to seek the Lord. So says Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Now, listen, we often use this verse to talk about evangelists going up, but that's not what he says. Break up your fallow ground. We become hard. We become quite self-contained, you know. And what we need to do in breaking up the fallow ground, what we're doing is we are exposing our need. We're opening ourselves up to the word of God. Remember when uh, Elisha was called on, there were three kings who were quite haughty. They'd been riding off to battle. Uh, they had no business being together. And they'd made this alliance. And they'd ridden off around south uh, by the Dead Sea. And they were going to attack Edom, and, uh, or Moab, rather. And, and they... Did you bring the water? Oh, uh, no, I thought you brought the water. <laughs> well, nobody had brought the water. And so they're desperate, and they call on Elisha. And Elisha says, I am so upset, I'm going to have to listen to some music first. You ever feel like that? Turned on some music. <laughs> and, and it calmed his soul. And then he said, get off your high horses, gentlemen. Get out the pickaxes and start digging channels in the dust. Now, there was no water. It wasn't groundwater they were looking for. This was going to be supernatural water. It wasn't going to come from the ground. It wasn't going to come from the rain clouds. God was going to provide the water. What were they doing? They were exposing their need. They were getting before God and saying, Oh, God, we're dry as dust. We're not going to kid ourselves anymore. We are, we're cynical. We're critical. We're, we're occupied with this world. We're distracted by our silly little pleasures, our cars and our gardens, and, and we don't care about the lost as we should, and we don't care about the people of God the way we should, and we don't care about the truth the way we should. And oh God, look at us. We're, we need the water. We need what only you can give. And they were willing to open themselves up. Oh that God would hear the cry from young people who've been dilly-dallying in the world, who've been playing around, who've been, who've been living for their careers or living for the latest fashions or whatever it might be, for older Christians who have grown cold in their hearts and, and also have been distracted, for elders to get down and say, Oh God, 
This is, this is not like the book of Acts. We don't, we don't love like they did. We don't care like they did. We're going to be honest. We're going to open ourselves up. I'll never forget being in a large African-American assembly in the inner city of Detroit. They don't believe in the one-hour service, you know. <laughs> Uh, they, they laugh at us white folks. They say, uh, oh, Lord, send revival and make sure you send it by 12 noon sharp. <coughs> they go on for hours. And after I'd preached about three times that morning, I thought the thing was wrapping down about 1.30. We'd been there since 8.30. But um, an elder took the microphone and he stood up and he said, now, Brother Nicholson has poured his heart out three times already this morning. Who's going to do something about it? And an elder got up. I've been talking about speaking kindly to your wife. He got up, tears, I can see him yet, dripping off his chin as he stood before the whole assembly and said, Charlotte, I'm sorry. I'm an elder, and I spoke ill to you this week, and I'm ashamed of myself. Please, uh, the assembly, Charlotte, please forgive me. I tell you, I, I could just imagine the heart of God as he looked down and saw that brother willing to humble himself and acknowledge his sin. Do you think the assembly thought ill of him because of that? Do you think they thought, what good is that elder? No, their hearts were warm to a man like that. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to break up the fallow ground. Till the Lord come and rain righteousness upon you. We need a good dose of righteousness rain, don't we? Doing what's right, being what's right. Doing what's right in our business, doing what's right to our family. Maybe we have to call up our children, our married children, and we've given them a rough time, a hard time, and we need to call them up and say, could, could we get together? I'll tell you, three or four years ago, after my father died, I went through a very, very searching time and I realized that I had neglected my children and I, I had treated the work of God more important than they were. And I had to take them, the older ones out one at a time and confess that their father had not been a good father as he should have been. Were they hard on me? My oldest boy, the next day at work, he brought in a bunch of photographs showing a picture of the two of us riding horseback and making a snowman as if to say, Dad, come on, you were around, we, you know. He could only find three or four photos, I think, but, but I was ashamed of myself. And you know, Christians, it's hard, it's hard for us to say it, but we're not going to move ahead until we're ready to be honest. And it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to get serious about the gospel, isn't it? The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, by the way, he said it, in the heart of Samaria, we might imagine, dare I say it, the south of Ireland. He said, Say ye not there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He took them into the next arid, the next town, the next region, and Samaria to them was a pretty distasteful place. They, they didn't naturally like to go into Samaria. The, the Jews avoided Samaria. They went round it. And you know, for centuries, um, Irish missionaries have been going round it, you know. They've been going all over the world. And the Lord says, and I firmly believe it, that Ireland is ripe for harvest. I believe it's ripe for harvest. Not just ripe, it's overripe. That's what it means when it says it's white to harvest. We'll never make it treating the Great Commission as a hobby for our free evenings or as someone else's business or as something we do in the safety of our own buildings. There's risk involved in this. There's risk in fighting. There's risk in farming. There's risk in fishing. There's risk in finance. All the pictures that the Lord uses of gospel, there's risk. And it's okay to fail. Did you know that? It's okay to fail. It's okay to try and fail. 
Winston Churchill in the dark days of World War II said this, it's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. God has called us into a battle, into a war. And you know, sometimes we, we stand on the sidelines and we watch somebody try and struggle and not do it very well. Remember the story of D.L. Moody, when a man sitting in the audience was noting all of his grammatical errors, Moody was famous for them, and came up afterwards and showed him all of the mistakes he had made. <coughs> and Moody, he said to Moody, I don't like the way you preach the gospel. And Moody said, how do you preach the gospel? Oh, he said, I don't do it. Ah, said Mr. Moody, then I like the way I do it better than how you don't do it. And you know, uh, as young people go out to serve the Lord, they'll make mistakes. And that's okay. The Lord allows us to fail. He allowed Peter to fail. He allowed Thomas to fail. He allowed James and John to fail. He allows us to do that. He doesn't allow us to do wrong. He doesn't allow us to go out and consciously do wrong. But he allows us on occasion to, to make mistakes. And he knows how to turn them into blessing anyway. But you know, we can't afford to have passion without compassion. I sometimes wonder when I hear gospel being preached, there's a lot of passion in it, but I wonder how much compassion there is in it. We should never preach the gospel to people in a way that we ourselves would be offended. I mean, do you like people to scream at you? Foam, foam flecking from their lips? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. I don't think the unsaved like it either. If you have strong arguments, if you have strong principles, if you have strong truth from the Word of God, you don't need strong rhetoric. You know the story of the preacher who, as he was going through his notes, uh, had, had a little marg marginal note saying, uh, thump the pulpit, weak point here. Right? So <laughs> if, if we come to a point where we think, well, we're going to have to bulldoze people into this. We'll have to keep talking faster and louder so that we'll sort of overwhelm them. That's not, that's not the style the Lord Jesus used, is it? So if we're going to communicate the gospel, the thing that they will hear most of all will be our compassion. There is an elder in an assembly in Jersey City who came to America as a Muslim missionary. He said to me, he met some of the young people on the campus, the college campus, and he said, I, I thought I could answer their arguments, but I couldn't answer their graciousness. When you talk to people the first time, probably they won't make sense of much that you say, but they will see whether you love them or not. It's not our love, it's the love of Christ. It's the love of God spread abroad, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. I, I think we need to learn how to weep for the lost again. I, I, speaking to my, I'm preaching to myself here. I, I sometimes go down to a rescue mission and I look at those men and I think to myself, oh God, I don't care about these people. I don't love them. Teach me how to love them. You love them. Teach me how, take me into your school. Teach me how to love these men. Because that's what's going to get across, isn't it? Do I really care about them? And if I care about them, I will, I will not only be compassionate, I'll be considerate. I'll be considerate. I, I won't be brusque with them. I won't make them feel awkward. I won't make them feel like they don't belong there. It's time to learn how to pray for the lost, how to care for the lost. There's a beautiful little story in a book by Mary Ann Bird called The Whisper Test. She said, I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate. 
And when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others, a little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade, and we all adored, Mrs. Leonard by name. She was short, round, happy, a sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back. Things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put in her mouth. Those seven words that changed my life, Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. That's the heart of God to sinners. I wish you were mine. And we have it in our hearts to do it, brothers and sisters. The Lord has put such words into our mouths. We beseech you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Won't you come to heaven with us? God wants you to be his little child. That's our message, isn't it? Oh, what a message we have for this cold, hard, lonely world, for people whose hearts and lives are broken and they, they have no place to turn to speak such words at such a time as this. It's time to invest in one another's lives too, isn't it? Here's what the writer to the Hebrew says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another. In other words, throughout the day, throughout the week, we make a conscious effort to think through the people in our local assembly and to pray for them and to think of ways to enhance their life, to brighten their day, to encourage them. I think I told you that a couple of years ago I was here and I spoke on that verse, encouraging one another daily. And a year later, I came back and an elder came to me and said, you see that young man over there? Yeah. He's revolutionized our assembly. He's the, he's the most encouraging man in our assembly. He took that word seriously. And every day since you left, he's found a way to encourage another Christian in the local assembly. An email, a phone call, a fax, a card, some fresh baked cookies, a few flowers. There are a thousand ways to do it. Just to say, I care. I appreciate you. Folks, it's a cold world out there. It's a lonely world. It's a hard place to live. It's hard for Christians to live in this world. We're behind enemy lines. We need each other. We need a little word of encouragement. We give away words of encouragement like they cost a thousand pounds a piece. You can throw them around. You can say, brother, I appreciate you. I thank God for you. I pray for you. It makes such a big difference. It's time to reach out in true Christian friendship, the kind of friends who love at all times, not just when you're in or when you're out, but they, they love you all the time. It's time to seek reconciliation and damage friendships. It's time to care. They say there's nothing costs as much as caring, except not caring. It's time to catch a fresh vision, a fresh vision of the Savior, a fresh vision of the work that he's called us to do. Your life is hid with Christ in God. The Lord is coming back, isn't he? And now's the time for us to expend ourselves, to pour out ourselves and give ourselves wholly to the cause. So what is the way forward for us? I think first of all, we need to remind our hearts that the church is all we have. 
We need to be positive, to accentuate the positives, to appreciate the good things, and to note them. This is the will of God in everything give thanks. It's not just a suggestion. It's the will of, you want to know the will of God, young people? Well, you think of as many things you can be thankful for in the life of your local church, and the heart of God will be pleased by it. Make a list if you have to, and think of the things you can thank God for. It'll sweeten your heart to do it. Our local assemblies, they need our love and our loyalty. We need a to have a commitment to a local church, but we need a vision bigger than a local church. We need to see a bigger slice of the picture because when our local assembly is going through a hard time, we need to realize, yes, but look down the road. God is blessing there, and if he can do it there, he can do it here too. We need to see every problem as an opportunity to minister. Every need, every Every difficulty, say, wow, that looks like a perfect situation to show grace, to show love, to show thoughtfulness and kindness. To see these as opportunities for service. The more needy the assembly, the more opportunities to serve the Lord. And then I think we need short-term and long-term goals. What is our long-term goal? What, what is the long-term objective? Well, it's got to be the same as the Lord's, doesn't it? It's got to be Ephesians 4, till we all come in the unity of the faith to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's our, I hope that's our hope. And you know what that means? That means that we are praying to God that all the signs will come down and all the divisions will disappear. And all of God's people will go back to the book. And we'll begin to do it just like he did. We'll begin to follow his plan. That, I mean, that ought to be our prayer. Not that we're going to make any sort of man-made linkage. But we're going to recognize that the heart of the Lord Jesus is that they may be one. He's not talking about your little circle or my little circle. He's talking about all his people. That's his, that's his desire. And it should be our prayer, Lord, we would just love to be involved in the process of linking up with all the people of God. No compromise, not a word of it. That should be the desire of our hearts. Anything short of that is missing the will of God, the purpose of God, isn't it? But that's what he wants, and that's what we should want too. In the shorter term, of course, what we long for ourselves is that our local fellowship, where we are presently residing, that that becomes more and more like the book of Acts, like the New Testament church, until you couldn't tell the one from the other. I think that's what we should hope for. To have true New Testament gatherings of the people of God. We need an enlarged vision. We've been talking about Ireland. I don't know, are there five million lost people? Maybe a few less than that in Ireland, four, four million, I don't know. I was thinking if there are 10,000 serious believers, as there were in the early church, the Lord saved 3,000 and 5,000 and there were a few others. There are about 10,000 believers that began in Jerusalem and they spread out and they took the gospel to the whole world in one generation. So if we think about Ireland and the needs of these five million souls, however many are, are, are not saved, if there were 10,000 believers serious about it, it would simply mean that two people a week for each of us to share the gospel with in five years, we would have evangelized every soul in Ireland. That's it. It's, it's doable. I'm not saying that, that we, we say, okay, I've done my two this week, I can put my feet up. I'm simply saying that it's, it's well within the range of, of getting done in a fairly short period of time if we would get on with the project. We need 
a concerted and united plan to prepare ourselves for this world in learning how to communicate the gospel in clear English so people understand what we're saying. And we need to take a good hard look at where we're going. Young people, is your career taking you on a path that will be the most efficient in your service for God? Is that, is that the issue? Are we taking a look at material possessions, at the, at the use of our time, at, at our choice of career? Are we asking this question? Are we saying to ourselves, I want not only glory from my life for God, I want the most glory. I want to maximize that. I want to use every resource I have for the glory of the Lord. That's really the heart of it, isn't it? And now is the time to have as our long-term objective, God's long-term objective. There's nothing unspiritual about that. To want to see our local assemblies, the place where you fellowship, just like the heart of God, just the way he wants it. But in the short term, what we need. I mean, if all the elders disappeared tomorrow, how would we fare? Would we be in better shape? Absolutely not. There's only a little bit of time, and we who are younger need to be hitting the book. We need to be studying. We need to be doing what Paul told Timothy to do. We need to be practicing hospitality. We need to be uh, learning how to share the gospel, how to counsel Christians who are struggling, how to properly explain the word of God. And we need to do it in a hurry. This will not be an hour here and an hour there. This is going to be as much time as we can muster because we've got a long way to go in a short period of time. There's a lot of work to be done. And I thank God for brethren in Northern Ireland who share that burden and who are hoping to see real concrete steps in that direction so that together we might grow and develop and encourage one another and see the flourishing, first of all in our own lives and then in our local assemblies, true New Testament vitality, true New Testament life. We're going to close now and uh, take a little break. I know I've gone over time again this evening, but I thank you for your indulgence. And uh, let's say that this evening, if you have questions, they can be on any of the topics that have been covered over the last two weeks. Shall we pray? Our Father, again, we bow our hearts in thy presence and we say, Lord, we're not what we ought to be. We thank God we aren't what we once were. We're saved by grace. We're on our way to heaven, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, united to thy people in the church. But we have a long way to go, and we confess that. Help us to be honest with thee. Help us to break up our fallow ground. Help us to get ready for the refreshing reign of righteousness. And we cry to thee, O God, help us to be ruthless with those things in our lives that have distracted us, that have robbed us of our effectiveness, that have kept us from giving thee the most glory from our lives. We commend ourselves to thee and pray that we might have a heart to go out to men and women, in boys and girls in this world, and in simple and clear and compassionate words, invite them to become the children of God. We pray that we might reach out to thy people, link our arms with every true child of God, and endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We thank thee for these nights together, and, O oh God, we pray that only blessing will result. We pray that when we look back on these days, we will say we heard the voice of God and we responded happily to it, and God brought blessing upon us more than we could ever imagine. It's just like God to do that, and we thank thee in his precious name. 